Hello, everyone. Welcome to Looking to the East. I'm your host, Steve Zurker. I'm a professor and dean at Kansai Gaidai University in Osaka, Japan, where I'm located today. The last few shows that I've done, unfortunately, have covered kind of depressing topics. Over the last two years or so, the world has seemed to be filled with bad news, uh, COVID, uh, the Ukraine situation, uh, the recent assassination of one of the most important political figures in Japan, that's uh, former Prime Minister Abe. <clears throat> but today we're going to focus on something that's much more positive. It starts out of a bad situation, out of the Ukraine war. But uh, this is a story, a very positive story, very upbeat story about how a small group of people with a very focused interest in supporting Ukrainian students have been able to work with the Japanese government and work with Japanese universities to bring in Ukrainian students and they'll be starting to study in Japan at various universities in just a few weeks. So I'm very honored, very pleased to have Paul Hastings with us today. So Paul, thank you so much for doing this for us. I really appreciate it. <clears throat> Paul is the uh, CEO of the Japan ICU Foundation, and that's the key group that's put together this initiative. There are other partners involved, and we'll get into that as we discuss this in more detail. But first, Paul, I want to find out a little bit about you. So this is a very interesting position that you're in. So can you tell me what led to this? Did you study this type of thing, uh, nonprofit organizations or international support organizations as a student? Or tell me how you got to become the president and CEO of the Japan ICU Foundation. Great. Well, thank you, Steve, for having me today. Um, so I'm going to give the short version because there's a longer version and we don't have time for that. Um, the short version is that I grew up in Japan for most uh -huh. of my childhood, so I had a connection to Japan already. Um, and then uh, my passion was sort of spurred by studying abroad, but not studying abroad. So I went to college in the United States, to Bowdoin College, and while I was there, I studied abroad in Sri Lanka. And that experience really opened my eyes to the world. Um, to different cultures, different religions, different ways of living, uh, to the extreme inequalities um, in the world, um, and to all of the amazing experiences, also amazing people out there. So I felt very um, connected uh, and interested in um, international education after that experience. And so I, I pursued a master's degree at a teacher's college at Columbia University in international education. Um, uh -huh. And I started working uh, at a relatively young age at the Japan ICU Foundation and sort of worked my way up through the ranks. So when you graduated from your master's degree, you went directly into the Japan ICU Foundation? I was actually already working at the Japan ICU Foundation, um, oh, which, okay. whose offices are right next door to Columbia University on Morningside Heights neighborhood of uh, New York City. Okay. Um, and so I had a chance to pursue a master's and uh, and then you know, continue with my professional okay. journey. Why don't you describe what the Japan ICU Foundation is? For my Japanese <laughs> viewers, uh, of course, you've heard of the International Christian University ICU. It's one of the better private universities in Japan, <clears throat> but um, you work for their foundation. So why don't you describe the history of that briefly? How, how was that set up and why, have, why has that group become interested in supporting refugees? Sure. So uh, the Japan ICU Foundation is based in New York City. We are independent of ICU. And we were founded actually one year before ICU was founded to help uh, raise funds in the United States to establish ICU. Now, mm -hmm. ICU was uh, founded in 1949 in West Tokyo, Mitaka, uh, Tokyo. And the, um, it was a project of reconciliation. So ICU is a liberal arts college. Um, you know, firmly committed to um, global citizenship and uh, to a bilingual education in English and Japanese. And so the Japan ICU Foundation was founded um, in the U.S. at that time. Now, fast forward 65, 70 years, um, our mm -hmm. mission currently um, is to nurture global citizenship in Japan and beyond. 
And we do that in partnership still with ICU, but also now with, with other institutions um, in Japan. Wonderful. And how long have you been with uh, Japan ICU now? Uh, now it's been 16 years. Oh my so. goodness. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. Okay. Just as a as a plug to young people who might be watching this, um, you uh -huh. know, you, I think most people move jobs quite a lot, especially right yes. after college. Um, I did have a couple of jobs before this, but I've been now at the Japan ICU Foundation for 16 years, and I think there's something to say about staying uh, put and growing within an organization. So don't don't forget about that possibility as well when you are pursuing uh, your career. Right, and uh, it has led to this very interesting project that uh, mm. you and others in your foundation, plus other organizations I know, mm -hmm. um, have created for Ukrainian students. So why don't we talk about that? Now, you and I met several months ago yep. when you were still originating how this would all work. Mm -hmm. So uh, as I recall, you, uh, your foundation has a history of working with refugees in the past. So this is not, it's new for Ukraine, but not necessarily new in terms of helping refugee students come into Japan. Is that correct? That's right, Steve. So we started supporting refugee students in 2017 um, in a formal way. We had supported scholarships for refugee students in the past, but sort of on an ad hoc basis. And in 2017, in response to the Syrian civil war, uh, we launched a program called the Syrian Scholars Initiative. And it was in collaboration with the Japan Association for Refugees, uh, JAR, which is based in Tokyo and is one of the largest um, independent nonprofit organizations focused on refugees uh, in Japan. Mm -hmm. And so we had this, uh, this history of supporting Syrian students. And when we started that program, we didn't really know very much about the world of refugee higher education. Um, and in, indeed, we didn't even know the term complementary education pathways, um, which I'd love to explain a little bit more about today, because that's mm -hmm. what this Ukraine program is. Um, okay. But basically, uh, a complementary education pathway is an opportunity for a refugee to travel from their uh, country of asylum, a first, first asylum, to a, a third country to pursue uh, higher education. So this is part of UNHCR's um, education strategy. It's called the 2030 education strategy. And they have a goal of increasing the number of refugees who are able to pursue education from the current percentage, which is 5% of refugees, to 15% by 2030. And the way that they're doing this is by promoting what they call education pathways. It's complementary to resettlement, which is the more traditional way that refugees are resettled from one country to another country. I think most people right. are familiar with that. Right. So one of the amazing things, you and I have talked about this several times, is that Japan historically has been very reluctant. I, I, very is not <laughs> the right term. Extremely reluctant to allow any refugees into this country. And uh, that would be an interesting topic for a show in and of itself. Mm. But, uh, you know, historically, I remember reading that the number of refugees that were accepted by Japan was less than 10 per year. Mm -hmm. It's really a, a small number historically. But in this instance, uh, Japan official response, government mm -hmm. response to the Ukrainian situation is completely different. So mm -hmm. let's talk then about how this all got started. So. Yeah. You had the experience with the Syrian placement program and complementary education. Mm -hmm. And then was it early this year that you thought, hey, there's going to be a ton of, of uh, Ukrainian students that are going to be displaced, obviously, mm -hmm. by what's going on there. So why don't we open up the program for them? Is that how this got started? Yeah, basically. Um, so Russia invaded Ukraine on February 24th. And the reaction from the international community, from universities, from civil society, was in, the, in, in sort of the quote unquote Western world was, um, you know, was, was uh, very supportive, of course, of, of Ukraine. And I was, we, myself and my colleagues um, who we work with uh, at Pathways Japan um, and my team at the Japan ICU Foundation, we were all 
seeing these kind of um, statements being put out by people, you know, we, you know, companies and corporations and, um, you know, universities, et cetera, about how they support Ukraine, you know, stand with Ukraine, which, which is fantastic. And it's great to have uh, that type of um, uh, support, but we felt like, well, we shouldn't just say something here. We need to, to do something. <laughs> so we thought, well, okay, just like you said, there will be um, a lot of uh, young people who are impacted by the war, whose educations are disrupted. Um, and, you know, might, might there be an opportunity here to try to, uh, to do something, to create a program uh, for Ukrainian students to travel to Japan? Um, so we, what we did, the, the, the first step in all of this is sort of gathering more information. Um, and so we very quickly networked with Ukrainian universities that have Japanese language programs. And we connected with some professors at these institutions. And we asked them, you know, do you have students who are being you know, displaced and whose schooling is disrupted and who might be interested in going to Japan? Of course, that's a natural group of students who already have an interest in Japan, already studying the Japanese language. Um, and the response we got was, yes, like we think that there would be quite a lot of interest in this. So we put together an application and uh, a website, and we started to you know, advertise the opportunity through this so Directly network, to the students themselves. Directly to the students themselves. Um, Interesting. I mean, of course, the other thing we did is that we, our, our partner ICU, that who we work really closely with, um, you know, they they said uh, we would also we would be interested in taking students. Uh, they very quickly, the president of ICU Shoichiro Yuakiri, he uh, put out a statement, and in conversations that I had with him, uh, he made it clear that ICU is very interested in supporting these students. So we had a, an interested university. We had the demand or the in, you know the need. You're, you're you're doing basic business analysis here. I, yeah. I, as a professor, I have to step in and so I'm giving you an A so far. You're assessing demand and you're looking at supply and trying to match those two things. That's great. Yeah. So we 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 went forward and and kind of created a pilot uh, program and we were able to recruit five students very quickly uh, who traveled to Japan in in early May. Mm -hmm. Um. In to, you know, to attend ICU as non-degree students initially. Um, and then uh, we started to have conversations with other universities. Um, that's when we first met and we first spoke right. yeah. um, about the possibility of Kansai Gaidai taking students and um, yep. through, yeah, through I that. I want to disclose that we, we are accepting two students in a few mm -hmm. weeks here at Kansai Gaidai. We're a part of this program. But Paul, uh, that how did you know or how did you create the conditions for the Japanese government to allow <laughs> Ukrainian students in? Because as, as we talked about before, historically, the Japanese government has been very reluctant to allow refugees in. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're, you're bringing them in under a quasi-refugee status. You know, of course, we have, our school has exchange programs. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a normal way of doing things. And the students I get a visa that's hosted by the university. <clears throat> but in this case, that didn't apply to the Ukrainian situation because it was all such, it was last minute. And uh, I don't know how many Japanese universities had a connection with Ukrainian schools. Uh, we don't. Mm -hmm. So how, yeah, how was that handled? Were you guys involved in that? Or uh, did you go to the government and say, look, this is what we're trying to do. And in order to make this a success, because we feel you know, there's a lot of students who would like to do this, uh, will you allow Mm -hmm. whatever number of students in I, did you how did, how did that happen it's a good question so it, it, it was not all our doing by any stretch of the imagination okay. i think that you know to give credit where credit's due uh prime minister kishida and uh you know various different ministries within japan uh, very quickly responded to the ukraine crisis and basically let it be known that japan is willing to take Ukrainian refugees. Yeah, um, it's not just students, but not just students. Well. And yeah. indeed, um, there was a, a Ministry of Foreign Affairs a flight that was even chartered and bringing you know bringing back Ukrainians very early on. If you re recall, wow. 
Um, yeah, I do so, remember that. Yeah, and so th what our, our, I guess the, the answer to your question is that our close working partners, um, Pathways Japan, which is a sister organization of JAR, the Japan Association for Refugees that I mentioned earlier. So mm -hmm. Pathways Japan was only founded last year with the specific function of supporting education pathways and other complementary pathways for refugees to come mm -hmm. to Japan. And mm -hmm. so they were sort of in the right position at the right time. And they also have very good contacts with, with the government, with different ministries in the government, with the Immigration Services Ag um, Agency, ISA. And you oh, know, so they, they, yeah, you have to have those connections. And right. um, so they, you know, went to them and they spoke with them and they said, you know, if we were to create this program, would would you be uh, willing to basically grant visas to the students? Because in the end, what what differentiates, I think, an education pathways program from just a refugee traveling on their own or something to a country is that it's a legal pathway. Mm -hmm. So this is a, a pathway that where there, there are visas in place, there is a sort of durable solution for the long term that's been thought through uh, for mm -hmm. the students. So the the response by the Japanese government has been and the Japanese people has been really phenomenal. I mean, it's been really encouraging from my perspective to see this response. Um, so it's 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 been amazing. It's not just the government, the um, Nippon Foundation. Uh, they also have created a program, a uh, very large program uh, to provide financial assistance to Ukrainians who are coming to Japan. Um, universities um, have you know, waived tuition for students, have agreed to cover dormitory fees or waive dormitory fees. Um, there's been just a, a really great uh, cooperative effort, <laughs> I think. Yeah. Well, that's wonderful. So tell us what this has led to. How many universities are involved with this program now for the coming fall semester, which starts in a few weeks for us and I think for most universities and uh, how many students in total are so, coming in what what are the results as you see them today so there are 12 universities participating um it, or taking students um mm -hmm. and 56 students have been placed Wonderful. um there is also another program that we're that our partners pathways japan are running uh, in parallel to the university pathways program which is a language school pathways program mm -hmm. so these are japanese language schools around the country that are accepting ukrainian students oh. and for a two-year language program as well so for that program there are 26 language schools participating and 50 students are being placed so if you combine these two efforts you know, 105, 106 or so uh, students uh, from Ukraine are going to be participating in this program. I think I, I'd like to also mention that there are other universities in Japan that have uh, decided to take uh, or accept Ukrainian students on their own. Independently? Um, independently of our program. Maybe they had a sister relationship with a Ukrainian university? Exactly. Typically, that's the case. Um, mm -hmm. But Todai also has, uh, which I, I don't think Todai had a, a close sister exchange partnership, but they are also taking some Ukrainian students as well. Yeah, Todai, for those that don't know, is the University of Tokyo, which is the number one school in, in the country. Mm -hmm. And they're, uh, I'm not current with their latest figures, but historically, the number of international students at Todai is quite low. Yes. Something they're not happy with, but unfortunately, it's, it's like one or two percent. So mm -hmm. this will help them grow that mm -hmm. number, I guess. Mm -hmm. Now, you've met with the students, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so tell me about that. I mean, um, <laughs> I'm looking forward to having our students show up uh, in a few weeks here, um, but they must be overjoyed. I, I, out of this terrible circumstance where they were looking at not completing their undergraduate degree, potentially, Mm -hmm. uh, to now coming to Japan, which I'm sure for many of them was unimaginable before. So out of this mm -hmm. horrible situation, I'm, they must be just so surprised and so mm -hmm. overjoyed that now they're going to become exchange students, just like you and I have been historically. Mm -hmm. 
and they're coming to this wonderful country, Japan, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, you know and I know they're going to have an incredible experience. So what's what's been your impression of the students so far and how is that aspect of it going? Well, it's the the best part of work, this this type of work is, you know, being able to get to know students and uh, and see their sort of how they can grow and the reactions that they have to these experiences. So I met um, the five students that I mentioned earlier who were part of that pilot um, mm -hmm. when they came to Japan in May. I happened mm -hmm. to be in Japan for my first business trip to Japan since the pandemic. Um, I was finally able to visit Japan and I met them on their first day on the ICU campus. So from that that interaction was it was it was for them I think was very overwhelming <laughs> because they had just arrived on campus right. um you know they were uh, they were you know talk you know they were they were talkative but they were clearly a bit overwhelmed <laughs> um that yeah, were, that's, yeah. that's the general response of any exchange student to yeah you know that was my response when i came to japan for the first time as an exchange student I, wow, absolutely yeah so interesting <laughs> so uh, i i did have a chance to interview um a lot of the candidates um when we had the second you know the major the, the, the larger application period um mm -hmm. and and that was really fascinating we we were targeting students who had some interest in Japan. We didn't require that they had studied Japanese before, but uh, some of the universities that where we were placing the students, you know, did have some kind of language requirement and some didn't. And, you know, regardless, we were looking at like, is this a genuine interest in studying in Japan or, you know, how much do you know about Japan? Do you, you know, they didn't have to have a, a long background in Japan, but they had to have some kind of interest that they could articulate. Um, and that was just a fascinating experience. Um, we conducted 99 interviews in total um, wow. over Zoom, 20 minute interviews. And, you know, these students were in Ukraine. Some of them were outside of Ukraine already. Many of them were internally displaced. Some of them mm -hmm. were in the western part of the country, which is relatively safe compared to the mm -hmm. eastern part of the country. So it really ran the gamut. Some had been um, you know, some some had lost family members, some had lost their homes, others, you know, were almost kind of going along, you know, normally in some ways. So it really ran the gamut. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it's just going to, I, I'm, I'm really excited about what's going to happen, you know, 10 years from now from mm -hmm. this group of students who have this experience of studying in Japan. Yeah. That's <laughs> so my. I'm an example, uh, I guess you're an example in a way, those of us that develop a love of Japan through our educational exchange, uh, we end up developing careers, uh, having to do with, uh, in my case, international business, and now with international education. So I've been here 11 years, it's probably, of our normal students that are coming in, the Ukrainian students may be even more focused on developing careers after they graduate. But it's usually 20 to 30 percent that end up staying in this country. Mm -hmm. You're falling in love. That's one thing um, <laughs> with a with a spouse or you know, partner or just the country itself or seeing the best career opportunities mm -hmm. in this country as opposed to the home country or other locations. So yeah, I fully agree with you that it'll be interesting where this first cohort of students end up going mm -hmm. uh, as they develop their careers because mm -hmm. they're getting this Japanese exposure right now and are going to graduate from a Japanese university. While we're running out of time, I knew this was going to happen because, mm -hmm. you know, there's so many interesting things to talk about. So obviously what's going on in Ukraine, unfortunately, is continuing. It, it just seems like this back and forth war and both sides are, are hardened now. <clears throat> so you know, I think when we first talked, there was the expectation that, that this the war would be resolved and there, the situation would settle down and maybe normal life would return. But that doesn't seem to be the case, mm -hmm. unfortunately. So in terms of the foundation and Pathways and JAR, these other organizations, are you guys beginning to plan for next year as well? So we are. We, we have a so out of so I mentioned 12 universities who are taking students. There are actually 18 universities that 
had expressed an interest in the program, but we weren't able to place uh, some students at certain institutions, partly because of the language, the higher Japanese language requirements of those institutions. Right. So the, as I mentioned, there's this program for uh, Ukrainian students to, to study at Japanese language schools in Japan. They, a lot of those students are gonna want to go to university after they finish their language school. And so we are planning a kind of a, a second round of the application for next year. We don't know the details yet, but basically the idea is that there will be um, students who are you know, eager to participate. And like you said, unfortunately, it, it seems like this conflict is going to be drawn out and it, it likely will not end soon. So I think the need will still be there. So we do want to continue this program. I also want to say just very quickly that we, we definitely want to expand the nationalities of students as well um, who can participate in these programs. So there are refugees from lots of different countries and the need is there. It's not just Ukraine, um, mm -hmm. you know, Afghanistan, Syria continues to have a huge number of refugees, um, mm -hmm. Myanmar. So we hope that Japan and the Japanese government and Japanese institutions will start to see the value in these programs um, uh, because it, it's really positive for the long term. I think that you, you're helping to develop a cohort of students who will, like you said, they're going to be uh, contributing to Japanese society for a long time to come. Right, exactly. So you think that perhaps this experience now with the Japanese government being more positive about supporting refugees, at least from Ukraine, may open up the door for other people to take advantage of the programs that have been developed and the goodwill that's developed through the UK, through Ukraine placement program, through your work and others. I certainly hope so. Yeah. All right, well, that, that'll be interesting to see. And uh, of course, I, we'll, we'll be uh, on a, a official basis or business basis and Kansai Gaide would be interested in those students as well. Thank you. Steve. All right, Paul. Well, the, the, uh, the half hour went by so quickly. Thank you very much for your clear description mm. of how this program has evolved and uh, congratulations on your great success. You mentioned you've been in this position now for many, many years, but I, I would <laughs> imagine that this particular experience has got to be the greatest one so far for you. It, absolutely. Yes. And thank you for having me on the show. Oh, it's my pleasure. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a wrap. And thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to Looking to the East and learning about this particular story uh, of Japan and the Ukrainian students and the good work that Paul and his foundation and others have invested in getting these students to come to Japanese universities in uh, just a few weeks. So they'll be starting. So very, very nice, very wonderful story. So thanks again, Paul. We'll be back on again in two weeks with another topic. Maybe we'll uh, talk about baseball next time, try and keep a more positive uh, flow. Uh, we're looking to the East, at least for the month of August. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.